my in my opinion, why Christians fail God? The first one says you, they fail because they don't count the cost. Hallelujah. So what I think is um, like if you want to get a place, well, I'll put it this way: rent a room or two rooms or three rooms, four bedrooms, but. You have to count the cost. You have to know how much you have in your pocket, how much you are earning. And you think about the, how many family, how many people you are getting the rooms for. If it's only two rooms you can afford, sit down and think about the cost. Are you going to manage it at the end of the month? Are you going to pay the rent because if you fail you fail woefully you'll be running around to borrow money to pay the rent and that alone is a disgrace so cut your coat according to your size so that you won't be a disgrace to yourself to the family and even god will not happy about it because that's why it says in um, Luke 14 25 to 35 if you have time you can read it but what I noticed there is that verse 28 that's the one I actually picked and he said sit down think about what you have in your pocket what you are going to spend and count the cost. If not, you will be a, the people will mock you because you know you cannot afford it, but you went for it because maybe your friends got four room flat or three bedroom flat, but you know in your pocket that you cannot afford it. So that's a failure in life. So think about it before you do anything. That's why I said cut your coat according to your size. Actually, um, uh, I know you didn't prepare for it, but <laughs> <laughs> she has really mentioned what I would have loved to say. Is that, um, there is need. Most times, uh, Christians um, um, uh, don't really know what they are going into. They think uh, Christianity is a bread and butter affair, mm. but it's very simple. If you really um, uh, get your mind tuned in to God and allow God. Give yourself to God and not allowing um, the flesh to be in control. You notice that um, it's an easy journey. Praise the Lord. Amen. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Yeah, one of the reasons why we fail God, it's uh, we fail God to be led. We fail because we refuse or directly or indirectly refuse to be led by the word of God. What do I mean? Oftentimes, most Christians are led by the prompting of uh, the flesh. But we know in the scripture, as uh, it's ex uh, expressed in um, John 1, John 1, 1, it said in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God, and the word is still God till date. So, but when we just live our lives and say, look, I'll do it by the arm of flesh without actually um, uh, allowing the word of God to minister to us and without allowing the spirit of God to take absolute control, we'll be missing it. We'll, we will be failing God in that aspect. So as Christians, um, uh, as it is expressed in uh, the book of... Uh, uh, Acts of Apostles, chapter 17, from verses 11 to 13, we should uh, not be ignorant because we should live our lives like uh, the Christians in Berea when uh, Paul went to Thessalonica. These were Christians who, for everything that happened, they will go back and search it out in the scripture and find out what it means to their life. So for we Christians, 
when we refuse to, or when we don't go to really do some of this uh, homework by allowing God to speak to us, you notice that um, directly or indirectly we'll be failing God. Praise the Lord. Yeah. And uh, other scriptures where you can get uh, some of these things that will buttress uh, the point we are making, you see that in um, 2 Timothy uh, 2 verse 15. And uh, Hosea uh, 4, 6. So in effect, what we are saying is that uh, Christians should really key into the word of God. Because the word of God is the sword of the spirit. And if you pattern your life, it's a template. If you pattern your life to God's word, you will notice that it will be a smooth journey for every Christian. Praise the Lord. So... Um we uh, fail because they are set in their own ways. And um, the Bible passage for that will be Proverb 14.14. 14. Proverb 14.14. 14. No. Proverb 14.14 14 says, uh, the, black, I mean, the backslider in her shall be filled with his own ways. And a good man shall be satisfied from himself. A backslider in heart shall be filled with his own ways, and a good man shall be satisfied from himself. This, if we have to sort of like look at our own life, we realize that uh, variably, if you're doing anything wrong, you always find an excuse to it. I mean, I can think of so many examples, but let's look at it this way. If you have always been consistent in church, and all of a sudden you decided not to come again, maybe once in a while you show up, but really and truly, the only reason that you probably will be given is that, oh, the shift you're doing, oh, this and that. But you know, you know in your heart of heart that you can always create because there's only one Sunday in a week. You know that you can always plan around it. Because after all, let's say, for example, where I work, there's a chap. He's a Muslim. Every Friday, nobody's going to argue with him. If I is at work, but he will go to his mosque to go and pray. If he goes to mosque, and they know it, so they will allow him. So we're talking about Sunday, and we all know depending on what sort of job you're doing. If you're a doctor, and uh, when I say doctor, the GP sometimes work Monday to Friday, I think. But uh, doctors sometimes, they work Sundays and all that. But you're not working every Sundays. But because you just feel like you're tired, I mean, I'm guilty as well. I'm guilty as well. I wake up every morning early in the morning I go. So when I get home sometimes, if I drive home, I'm not coming to church on Wednesday. But listen, I w I'm not going to die if I show up. But I'm just lazy, that's all. I mean, if you want to call it something else, you can call it. But that's pure laziness. Because you only have to come here one and a half hours and do what you need to do. And your good Lord will be so happy with you. But you see, the, the funny thing is that the other way around, if you do all these things, the way you're supposed to do it, you will be pleased with yourself and the good Lord will be so happy with you. You're not losing anything. It's a win-win situation. So I'm just encouraging us all to not give funny excuses when we know that we're just giving excuses. That's the way I say it. And the other reason is this deceitfulness of sin. We fail God because of deceitfulness of sin. Hebrews 3 verse 13. If you're there, you can read with me. It says... But exhort one another daily. That's exactly what we are doing now. We are exhorting one another. And the reason is why it is called today. And the reason is because lest any of you be hardened through the des deceitfulness of sin. Lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. That is to say that the sole aim or the sole end of the deceitfulness of sin is to make our hearts hardened and become apostate. I'm sure we don't want to get there. 
Now, the word deceitfulness actually means deception. It means deception. So, the first question we want to ask ourselves is, I mean, why is sin deceptive? What is the power in sin that drags us? Now, come to think about it. Anything that is deceptive, once you realize that this is what is deceptive about the thing, you begin to understand it and you begin to avert it. It's not true. So the first question is, I ask myself, what are those things? I mean, if you look at sin, sin is drawn from temptation, true or false? Very good. So if sin is drawn from temptation, there are three forms of temptation that we always see in this human life, whether the one that was tempted by Jesus Christ or whether the one that was tempted by anybody. Three temptations. Remember, temptation is different from trials. Temptation is we drawn from our own lust, according to James 1.14. When our own loss is fulfilled, we are enticed, and then we sin. And when we sin, the resultant is what? Death. So, the first thing is this. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life. Any sin you want to take part in, anything that comes your way, it is wrapped around those three things. It's wrapped around either it's the lust of the flesh. The lust of the flesh is, I just desire to want to do it. And we disappoint. I just desire, I want to do it. Usually, the lust of the eyes and the lust of the flesh are intertwined. You see a woman walking on the street, your eyes see her, and then you desire and want to take her to bed. So, it is wrapped around these things. It doesn't pass these things. And the, re- the other one is the pride of life. People are aimed, even if people are aimed at getting wealthy, they want to do anything to get wealthy. They want to do anything to have power. You see, when Jesus, when the devil tempted Jesus, he said, we took him to the pinnacle and asked him, said, look down and see. Anything you ask, I will give you. He was tempting him with what he's seen and was tempting him with what he can gain, which is power. But Jesus Christ already knows he already has power and authority. So why the devil wants to deceive him to get power? So every sin that com- comes out from these three X areas, once you unravel the deceitfulness of the devil, you are able to fight it. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. So actually, uh, one of the reasons, uh, because there are so many reasons uh, yeah. we can find in the Bible why uh, we fail God, which uh, we have um, trying to give some of them. And one of such reasons is that um, it has to do with a wrong association. Thank you, sir. Now, what do I mean by wrong association? Now, uh, um, this thing is, it, this can, I can only drive my point home uh, from this scripture. First King, uh, verse, chapter 11, verses 1 to 13. It's a long uh, a, a passage. But paraphrasing it here, it has to do with Solomon. We know Solomon was David's son. And uh, when David wanted to build uh, a place for God, God told him, no, you, your hands are, are bloody. And uh, David did all the fighting. They did, David did all the uh, warring. Uh, and uh, did, in fact, it was David that did the spade work for his son Solomon. Mm-hmm. So Solomon never pulled any trigger before he came into throne. And we know that Solomon... If for those of us uh, who are very familiar with the, uh, the, the scripture, David, uh, when Solomon did some sacrifice to God, and God appeared to him and said, look, give him a blank check. My son, what do you want? Anything you want, I'll give to you. But David, I mean, Solomon decided, he said, look, I know the people of Israel. These are stiff, stiff-necked people. These are very stubborn people, which we are in present times. Mm-hmm. When things are going fine, then we have a God on our side. When it is rough, we turn our back on God. This was one occasion that Solomon, despite all the things that God did for him, he now God left him with a clear instruction in that passage. Look, my son. You are going, when you go, don't go into these people, the Amorites, the Edomites, the Hittites, and stuff like that. But Solomon, in his own human wisdom, in his own sense, decided to go. He disobeyed God and decided now to not only marry the uh, uh, Pharaoh's daughter, 
Solomon now went and um, started having an unholy relationship with uh, the Amorites, the Edomites, the Hittites, um, um, God, which God told him not to do. And he went further. The scripture recorded that uh, Solomon had 700 wives. As if that was not enough, he went further to have 300 concubines. So on the whole, Solomon was adulterous, which was a sin. Solomon disobeyed God. And the point where I am interested in now is that how did the Amorites and the Edomites now um, um, uh, influence Solomon? Please, so, please, so. Influence Solomon. Because God had already instructed him, don't have anything to do with these people. Otherwise, they will take your heart away. And after their, I mean, they would tell your own heart to their own gods. And we saw it happening in that scripture by the time you go down it. So what are we trying to say? Solomon, because of that association, Solomon derailed. He derailed and God became anointed. He failed God in that aspect. Praise the Lord. And it is even in the present day times, we need to be very, very careful with uh, people we relate with, with our association. You, the youths, the women, the men, name it, it cuts across. Because there's this adage that says, look, that show me your friend, I will show you whom you are. And uh, the Bible also makes it very, very clear in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 33. It says, look, do not be deceived that evil communication corrupts good manners. A good Christian in the presence of a bad association might not know when you are saying the things that are offensive to God, behaving the way that is offensive to God. Therefore, we are saying that for Christians, we need to really, really, really guard our guards. We really, really need to know the kind of people we move with, the kind of things we say, the kind of friends we keep, the people we even go to for advice. If you have any problem, the first part of call should be God. So we have seen how this thing can affect a Christian. Amen. Even in present I mean in the present time dispensation. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. My second one is um they, they fail to listen to God messages. That messengers. Well, we have pastors, we have we have um, men of God, so many of them. They preach every day. Some of them, they preach the same thing, which is breakthrough, tight, money, 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 which is not really what they should do because they didn't listen to what God want them to say before they say it. So the, the, the messages, what they've been telling us, let me put it this way, this this week, I had something from a pastor on the telly. And uh, not that I really want to. He was talking about your tithe, what you bring to church. He said, as a man, was coming to give 20,000 as a tithe to the church. And on his way, he met an accident. That 20,000... He couldn't take it to church. He's there, but he needs somebody to help him. Because the pastor, he was going to give the 20000 to and the others. It's not saying you have to bring the certain amount. It says 10% of whatever you earn. So, this man had an accident and was taking somebody that he didn't know at all that hasn't got anything, and they didn't know that he had 20,000 on him, taken to church as his tithe. So he has an accident, and the person unknown completely to him took him to hospital. Now, they were asking for money to, take, to look after him. He's got 20,000 naira in his pocket. 20,000. 
And the money, all he needed to say was, I've got so and so. But because he has decided that that money is my tithe and I'm taking it to church. So he didn't even, he didn't even bother about his life, whether he's going to be saved or not. But the church, they were waiting because I suppose it must be one of the highest giver or whatever it is. So that one alone, the man, the man with 20,000, he has failed God already because he, he, he need the money to look after his own, to take care of his own life. But he was thinking about where the money is going. And the people there, they didn't know what has happened to him on the way. So failing God in um, Jeremiah, 20, Jeremiah 7, 25 to 28. I, I'll just speak on 26. Well, let me start from 25. Since the day that your fathers came forth out of the land of Egypt, unto this day I have even sent out to you all my servants, the prophets, daily rising up early and sending them. 27, I'm going to. He says, therefore, thou shalt speak all these words unto them, but they will not hearken to thee. Thou shalt also call unto them, but they will not answer. But thou shalt say unto them, this is a nation that obeyeth the voice of the Lord their God, nor receiveth correction. Truth is perished and is cut off their mouth. Their heart has been hacking. They, they don't want to hear. Even no matter how, how many times you preach the word, if it's the truth, the people, they will not listen to the truth because they want to do their own thing. That alone, they fail God. They fail the messengers that bring the messages to them. So they did not obey God's word. They just want to please themselves. So that is a failure to them. They fail because of uh, inactivity and complacency. Inactivity and complacency. So when you look at the word inactivity, meaning you're just folding your hand, you're not active. Complacency is that you just said everything will get back to where it's supposed to be without doing anything. So now we're going to look at James 2 14 to 26. But because it's a, a long one and we have a short time to deliver it, so um, I'm just going to pick the most uh, one that stands out to me. But in your own time, you can look at James 2 14 to 26. Okay, so. What good is it? You have faith. There's no action behind it. Faith and works. So it's just like, uh, I mean, just for you to understand what I'm trying to drive to you. It's just like if you play a lottery. So you're hoping to win. But if you don't play a lottery and you're hoping to win, what is that? Do you get me? So you play lottery, you're hoping to win. But you don't play and you're still hoping to win. You're never going to win because you don't play lottery. You can hear about people winning it, but you're not going to. So that is what we're saying, faith and works. So for example, along the line, when you look at what the Bible passage is saying, so if someone, if someone who is desperately in need of your help, and you're in that position to help, but you just look at that person. Let's say, for example, the, the simplest one. Someone is hungry. And you just finished cooking. And that person knocked your door. And but because the food you cooked was for you, your husband and your children. So you didn't even offer. And this guy is hungry or this lady is hungry. And you, you, you sort of like said, yeah, it's right there. Yeah, you sort of like said her and I said, just want to say, but mommy said we should cut our coat according to our size. <laughs> oh, no. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, boy, not in that sense, though. Because coat, coat according to your size that mommy is talking about is in terms of monetary, monetary. And that, you have to count the cost of the money. 
But in terms of food, you don't really have to count the cost because if you cook for one person, two people of three people can share it. You're still not going to die because you're not going to die. But if in terms of money, if you go and do what you're not supposed to do, you you will pay dearly for it. So, but in terms of food, you should be able to help one another. So you ask somebody and you say, God helps you, and then you start praying for that person. Prayer makes no sense when somebody is hungry. It does make no sense at all. So, in other words, what I'm trying to say is that try and help if you're able to. Your faith and your works. Stop. Don't try to say you have faith and you're not showing the works. So, it's useless. So, that's what we're talking about. Amen. Hallelujah. Another reason why we disappoint or fail God is because of false doctrines. False doctrines. Um, I'm particularly personal about false doctrines because I'm, I'm kind of a person that wants to study the word of God, listen to so many preachers preach and all that. But it came to a point in my life where I have to start, like the Berean Christian, start, you know, looking into what this person is been, is been, is preaching, you understand? Revelation chapter 2, verse 14 and 15, I will just read out. Revelation 2, verse 14 and 15. But I have a few things. Okay, first of all, this is, um, oh, no, John, sorry, talking to... God revealing to John about the church of Pegasus, you know, and was talking to, giving them a message. A life church is not something that was fake or anything. Now, he says, but I have a few things against thee, because thou hast dared them that hold the doctrines of Balaam, who taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel, to eat things, sacrifice unto idols, and to commit fornication. So hast thou also them that hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which thing I hate. Now, when I studied the scriptures, I came to understand that the doctrines of the Nicolaitans and that of Balak were not uh, different. The doctrines of the Nicolaitans was that you can be a Christian and still be doing things of the word. The doctrine that is going on now about one save, always save is almost the same thing. That you can be a Christian and still be doing the things of the world. Mm -hmm. You can still be enjoying the things of the world. No, that's not what it means to give your life to Christ. When you give your life to Christ, you mean you are surrendering your will to God. You are surrendering your life to Christ. You have, there have to be a difference between when you were not in Christ and now that you are in Christ. You cannot in any way try to combine God and combine the things of idols and say you are all worshipping God. It doesn't work like that. If a Christian who has that doctrine at the back of his mind and says, okay, I can also, you know, um, you know, communicate and also still go to church, there's no problem. I see my pastors even doing it. There's no problem about that. What gives him the impromptu for him to go against sin? Why, what will he fight against sin? Apostle Paul says that I discipline my flesh so that after preaching to others, I myself will not be a castaway. It is that serious. We walk at our salvation every day with fear and trembling. God is coming for a church without spots or wrinkle. You have to open your eyes. This, this is not child's play. Everybody has said here that it is not child's play. It is seriousness. So being a Christian is something you have to do actively, not passively. You have to be involved fully with all your heart, soul, and mind. If you do not do that, I tell you, you will surely disappoint and fail God. Yes. Yes. Refer to the Bellum virtues of the Christians. Mm. 2 Peter 1, 5-11. Yea, and for every cause adding on your part, all diligence in your faith supply virtue, and your virtue, knowledge, and your knowledge, self-control, and self-control, peace, and in and in your and in your self-control, patience, and your patient godliness, and in godliness, brotherly kindness, and your brotherly kindness, love. For all these things are yours and abound. They make you to be not idle, nor unfruitful, unto the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. For he that lacketh these things is blind. Seeing only what is near, having forgotten the clean sin from his old sins. Therefore, brethren, give the more diligence to make your calling and election sure. For if you do these things, ye shall never stumble. 
verse 11 for thus shall be richly supplied unto you the entrance into the internal kingdom of our lord and savior jesus christ thank you right what i what i think about that is um i mean i use this example for husband and wife if there's something wrong in the house and you are annoyed with your husband or your husband is annoyed with you you have to deal it with knowledge and patience there's so many ways that hunger can cause so many things in the house sit down together in a quiet place I'm not too big to say sorry, and the husband is not too big to say sorry to me. But this, not to fail what God wants us to do as a Christian. Call yourself together, sit down, and talk about it, and use a little bit of knowledge to be good to one another, to use the knowledge to understand one another, what the love stands for. You could be annoyed, and she could be annoyed, but watch whatever comes out from your mouth. Because if you say it, it might be too late to, re to, 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 retract. to, to retract it back. So, knowledge, kindness, you have to be good to one another. You have to do a lot of charity. You have to love. Love is the most important of this thing. You love one another because Jesus loves us too. Don't say because my husband offended me. That's that. I'm going to ignore him. I'm not going to listen to what he says. Respect him and she respects you. And whatever is going on between two of, of you, when you go to bed in the night, you can sort it out. Sorry there, I'm sorry, I will not. Or you, I'm sorry, my wife. This, let's forget about it and move on. So that actually is a virtue that you are a, a clean Christian and you obey and you do what God wants you to do, to love with all your heart, with, with everything you have, with you, your family, your husband, and whatever. And I was going to say this, if your child offend you, in the house because we all know them you've been telling them stop this stop that they don't don't use your mouth to say something contrary to what you want to say because whatever you say is a stand you don't know what type of angel is passing at that time tell the father sit down together call the child and tell him what you are doing is no good. It leads to destruction. What, where you are going is no good. You can meet anything and there will be nobody there. But to be a good Christian in a home, you learn and your children take from you as well. That's a good virtue of a Christian that you will not fail God in anything you do. And I pray that God will help us to have the mind, the peace, to trust him and to do everything that he asks us to do. Uh, I think uh, one of the reasons uh, why we fail God, it has to do with uh, the demands of uh, this life, demands and pressure of life. Yeah, um, and uh, this uh, point the only way it can be expressed very well, it can uh, be driven home very well, is when we look at uh, uh, the scripture, Luke. Luke uh, chapter 8, verse 9 to 14. But prior to that, uh, it was Jesus that was teaching the disciples. And he was now teaching them with a parable uh, about the sower and um, the seed and uh, the ground where it was going to fall. Uh, if you read uh, this passage, uh, just for want of time, let's see 9 to 14. But let us see in particular, uh, I'll be very brief about it. Let me read from there. It says, 
uh, and his disciple, uh, Luke, Luke 8, and his disciple asked him, saying, what might this parable mean, be? And that is the parable of uh, the sower. And he said, unto, un, <coughs> unto you, it's given to know the mysteries of the kingdom of God, but to others in parables, that seeing the they might not see, and hearing they might not understand. 11. Now the parable is this. The seed is the word of God, which is the sword of the Spirit. Those 12, those by the wayside are they that hear. They that come, then come at the devil, and take it away the word of uh, the hearts, lest they should believe and be saved. 13. They on the rock are they, which when they hear, they receive the word with joy. And this have no root, and which for a while believe, and in time of uh, temptation fall away. 14, which is the one I want you to pay particular attention to, is, And that which fell among thorns are they, which when they have heard go forth and are choked with cares and riches and pleasures of this life and bring no fruit to perfection. So what are we trying to say here? What we are just trying to say is that uh, the pressure of life can really be so uh, uh, exerted on Christians. And uh, when you begin to put your focus on the pressure, it will make you derail. So um, uh, the scripture is telling us that we should not look at the wind. We should look at the word. Because by and large, the storm will come. Whether you like it or not, the storm of life will come. It comes in so many forms and shapes. It comes in so many, whatever degree. Yeah. But the bottom line there is that refuse to look at the storm. When you refuse to look at the storm and begin to focus on the master Jesus, the one who is the author and finisher of our faith, the one who is God yesterday, the God of today, and keeps, will still be our God tomorrow, when you put your focus on him, whatever pressure, I know it will be hurting at that time. It will be painful at that time. But at the end of the day, you will become victorious. If there had not been a Penina, there wouldn't have been a Samuel. I, I, I think I'm correct. Because uh, Hannah was tormented. There are certain problems that when they come, when you're passing through this wilderness experience, it's really good that the, the experience comes. So that one, it humbles you. Two, I mean, your mind is renewed. And three, allow, it now makes you, um, I mean, a better Christian and uh, reposition you to face the challenges ahead. So what are we saying? These pressures can make us fail God. But one thing you have to have in mind is that if you go back to, though it's not in this scripture, if you go back to uh, Matthew 6, 25, Matthew 6, 25, down to Matthew uh, 33, that is where God is even telling you, yes, these things I know. You will have them. There will be problems. That, But remember, the flowers, the lilies, if I can take good care of them, I see them now and tomorrow I don't see them again. You that I have created in my own image and in my own likeness, look, I have you enshrined in the palm of my hand. So, I, I can uh, do anything. I can kill a man. I can wipe a nation as a ransom for you as a Christian. So, if we have that at the back of our mind and hold on to God, we will not fail God. But remember, this pressure... And these distractions, they can make us fail God. Praise the Lord. They fail because of the desire to be rich and to hold on to their riches. Uh -huh. Matthew 19, 16 to 22. You probably want to ask me, am I really against uh, riches? And the answer will be no. Obviously, in this world that we're living right now you need whatever you want to do you need one thing called money so I'm all for 
progression. I'm all for, you know, having money. But when the money takes over, when it takes over everything in your life, that's where the problem comes in. Because uh, I can give you a very good example of a, a very rich guy. Not in the Bible, but here in this world. And you all know him, Bill Gates. The guy gives serious amount of money away every year. That's what we know about. But what about the one that he's doing without us? You know? So my point is that, of course, you have to put things together. You have to wait. You, because too much of everything is bad for us. I mean, let's be honest with ourselves. If the doctors or the nurses or whatever are asking you to drink loads of water, you know when you don't have a cut of time, you're not going to sleep well. You know that. If you're drinking buckets of water around 10, 11 at night, you know you're not going to have a good sleep. So, when your point or aim in life is money, 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 before you know it, your children will be misbehaving without you knowing. But remember, I said before you know it. Without you knowing. Because you will go out in the morning, come out at night, you're tired. You're exhausted. You just want to find something to eat and go to bed. Same thing with your wife or your husband. If both of you are chasing after money, you won't even know what hits you until it hits you. So, we're not saying money is bad. But it's the way you handle it. That's what is bad. Because let's face it, pastor just said, you have to pay for this bill, pay for that. We need money. You're not going to pay for that with prayer. You need money. So, Paul, we're balancing it. He goes out early in the morning. He comes here. He does this, he does that. He can easily say he's tired by Sunday and he will tell the other pastor to preach, oh, uh, I'm going somewhere else. Meanwhile, he's at home sleeping. So, balancing. Balancing. Balancing is what we're asking for. Praise the Lord. Um, another reason why Christians fail God is that they refuse to guard their heart diligently. Hallelujah. They refuse to guard their heart diligently. Let's go to Proverbs 4, verse 23. Proverbs 4, 23 says, Keep thy heart with all diligence, because out of it comes the issues of life. Keep their heart with all diligence. Now, if you look at the word diligence, the word diligence means you are persistently doing it. You don't have to do it today and then leave it tomorrow. Mm. So, it is a consistent, persistent keeping and guarding of your hearts. Now, you may ask me, why do we need to keep our heart with all diligence? What's the thing about the heart that we need to keep with all diligence? I'll tell you. If you look at Matthew 15, verse 18 to 20, we have time to read it right now. You will clearly see that Jesus was saying, it is not what a man swallows that defiles him. Yes. It's not what a man eats that defiles him. Whatever you eat, go through your sofa goes and you shit it out in the, a stool in the toilet. It doesn't defile you. It is what comes into your heart and your heart brings it out. So the next question you want to ask is, what is the in way? What is the in road to your heart? Sars, the in road to your heart is your eyes and your ears. I repeat, the in road to your heart is your eyes and your ears. So you have to be careful what you watch. You have to be careful what you listen to. You have to be careful what you see. Because whatever you see and watch stores in your heart. Yes. And when there is trouble, that is what you will react with. Imagine, all you watch is Nigerian movies, for example, Nollywood. And you see that they're all trying to cast one. There's a demon pursuing somebody every time. Before you know it in the night, what happens? You see a cockroach, you start shouting, hey, demon. <laughs> because that is what is in your heart. That's what you fill your heart with. Yeah. You must ensure to guard your heart with all diligence. Very important. If you go back home today and you decide to go and say, for example, let me, I, I always give this example, right? Someone who gives life to Christ today but watched a pornographic movie yesterday, what's going to happen? He's going to remember the pornographic, pornographic movie today that has given his life to Christ. Because the spirit has changed, not his soul and not his body. So, think about it. If you fill your heart with those kind of things, when you see a 
lady going on the street, the first thing that comes to your mind is how to commit fornication and adultery with her. But you fill your heart with the word of God. You tell yourself that you are the righteousness of God. You fill your heart that you are God's apple on God, apple of God's eye. You are the best. You are the head and not the tail. You fill your heart with what God says you are. I'm telling you, you will not fall to temptations and trials. You will overcome them as they come. People talk about pressures of life. If you take a bottle, for example, and it's filled up with nothing and exact pressure outside, what's going to happen? It's going to squeeze. Yeah. But if there is something inside, if there is something inside, the pressure inside will come back to the pressure from outside. Mm. It is what fills your heart that is able to combat the pressure from outside and makes you to withstand the wiles of the devil. Okay. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Nothing else to say anymore. There are many, many reasons, but these reasons that we have managed to, our, our panel has managed to deliver to you today. I want you to take them serious. I want you to look at your life, and I want you to check yourself. And if there needs to be a change, people of God, I want you to change. Praise the Lord.